Christians believe that Jesus was crucified at a place called Golgotha, outside the walls of Jerusalem on Good Friday. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. <laughs> when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Three days later, on Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead, leaving the tomb empty. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The tomb is significant to Christians of all denominations because it is the site of Jesus' burial and of his resurrection. But whilst the Bible tells us about the events of Holy Week, after 2,000 years, we are less certain about where these events took place. In this program, the team of Real Discoveries asks you to join them in their quest.
Jesus. When Simon arrived in Jerusalem at the very beginning of his search, he got into a conversation with a man in a cafe and told him about his journey. The man quickly volunteered to take him to the tomb of Jesus. But as he followed him down dark alleys, he asked himself if his guide was really a guide at all, and if he planned to rob him instead. Certainly, the man tried to lure him into souvenir shops. But eventually, he took him to where he wanted to go. But was it where he wanted to go? He soon realized that Jerusalem has two sites, each of which is considered by Bible scholars and archaeologists to be the true tomb of Jesus. But they can't be both be the site. And why have the arguments about Jesus' tomb become so enmeshed with issues of doctrine and denominations? To begin at the beginning, there are two sites laying claim to the actual tomb of Jesus, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which we shall look at first. And the Garden Tomb. The site where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre stands has been visited and venerated for longer than its rival, the tomb in the garden and has all the authenticity of ancient tradition to bolster its claim. The site was discovered by the mother of an emperor, later to be declared Saint Helena, and her son Constantine the Great ordered the first church to be built. So, its credentials are impressive. In 313 AD, Constantine had declared Christianity the official state religion of the Roman Empire and transformed what was still a minority sect into a religion that would dominate both the Western and Eastern empires. But over time, Christianity fractured into many denominations, each battling with the other for control of the shrine we call the Holy Sepulchre. Saint Helena, Constantine the Great's mother, newly converted to Christianity, set out from Rome from Palestine to find the site of both Jesus' crucifixion and his burial. The Romano-Greek historian Socrates Scholasticus, who wrote his ecclesiastical history less than a century later, tells us that Helena found not only the burial site, but also wood, nails, and fragments of the true cross. The site was covered by the building work ordered by the Emperor Hadrian after the Jewish revolt in AD 70, when the Temple of Solomon was destroyed. Two Muslim families were given the right to guard the church, one to hold the key and the other to guard the door. This tradition continues today in a line unbroken since Saladin ordered it so in 1192. As the Christian church fragmented, the Muslim Ottoman Emperor gave each sect a zone of control, part of the church for which they were responsible, where they could celebrate their own liturgy. Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, Armenian Apostolic, Ethiopian Orthodox, and Coptic Christians were included. Now Jerusalem is a city in the State of Israel. This arrangement continues even today. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is heavy with tradition. It is the spiritual home of all the major Christian denominations, excepting Protestants. But is it the site of the tomb of Jesus or simply tradition? Has the site simply had too much invested in it? Before we move on, 
Let us take a closer look. Most of the present church was built in the 19th century, and although the first dome was built in the 4th century, the dome of the rotunda you see here dates only from 1870. Just inside the entrance, we can see the anointing stone where the women would have prepared Jesus' body for burial. To the west, or left, we have the rotunda of the Anastasis, and beneath that, the Eticule of the Holy Sepulchre. Eticule in Latin means a small building, which describes it very well, as you can see. To the right, which is to the east, we can see a stairway that leads to Golgotha, or Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. One problem, as you can see here, is that the whole area has changed so much, it's pretty well impossible to tell what this site was like 2,000 years ago. There's just so much tradition and uncertainty about this one. The group decided it was time to investigate the other site, the Garden Tomb. You can see here how very different this site is. There is no church, just a quiet and peaceful garden. The first thing we noticed was the absence of noise. Outside, the city continues its frenetic, bustling pace, but in here, just the most tranquil place you could ever imagine yourself to be. The quiet and sense of presence makes you want to believe this is the true site of Jesus' tomb. The guide is quietly authoritative and we are all enthralled. When he leaves us alone, we contemplate and explore the place for ourselves. The first thing to notice is an absence of traditional church ceremony it is as though we are stripping away the detritus of generations and getting back to the very early church, the days and months after Jesus' resurrection. But before we get carried away with the beauty of this place, let us examine its credentials. What evidence do we have that this is the tomb of Jesus? First of all, Although there is evidence that early Christians believed this was the true site, it lay pretty well undiscovered until the middle of the 19th century. Until 1867, the site was a wasteland, and nothing was discovered until the Greek family owning the land decided to dig for water. They found a cave which they decided to excavate further to install a water cistern. First, they consulted an architect named Conrad Schick, who was also an amateur archaeologist. And when he inspected the site, he found evidence of a Jewish tomb dating from the first century. He counseled the family to leave the site alone. But by this time, considerable interest was building up in the city and beyond. One of the people who heard about the tomb was General Charles Gordon. Gordon was the archetypical Victorian military hero. He had fought in China, where he had made his name, and was often referred to as Chinese Gordon. As well as his military exploits, he was a devout Anglican Christian who spent much of his time in Palestine looking for biblical sites. As a result, the Garden Tomb, as we now call it, for many years was called Gordon's Tomb and Gordon's reputation was only enhanced by his death in 1885 in Khartoum in the Sudan, besieged by the Islamic self-styled prophet, the Mahdi. These events were portrayed in the 1966 film Khartoum with Laurence Olivier playing the Mahdi and Charlton Heston, Gordon. We mention Gordon's involvement in the discovery of the Gordon or Garden Tomb because as we shall see later, a great deal of the attribution issue 
tends to turn upon the status of the personalities involved. A Roman emperor, a saint, and a British military hero who died a brave and romantic death. In time, the family owning the site decided to sell. It was already becoming a prime item of real estate and the Times of September 22, 1892 carried an appeal to raise 2,000 pounds to buy it. Two years later, the site had been bought and excavations begun under the leadership of two redoubtable women amateur archaeologists, Charlotte Hussey and Louisa Holt. The excavation took almost half a century, but in the end, the site was very much as we see it today. From time immemorial, it had been called Skull Hill, and Golgotha is Aramaic for the place of the skull. If we look at the site from here, we can clearly see the shape of the eye sockets and the nose. Gordon was sure that this was the correct site because St. John tells us that at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been buried. According to the Gospels, the tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy merchant who had the tomb made for himself and his family. The speed of events in Holy Week took the disciples by surprise. It was evening, the Sabbath was the next day, and Jesus had to be buried now. Joseph's act of generosity singles him out down the generations, so we know his name and we know what he did. This site features in the Old Testament where it is called Mount Moriah and where Abraham was told by God to sacrifice his only son Isaac. So, the symbolism of this place in both Jewish and Christian terms is very great. The team were conscious wherever they walked that their steps fell on ground which had been holy for thousands of years. It was a very moving experience and one that filled them with awe as the guide left them to explore on their own, to contemplate this place and consider the evidence. St. John tells us that the site where Jesus was crucified and where he was buried was outside the city walls, somewhere high up that could be seen from a long way off. The whole point of crucifixion is that it is highly visible, a terrible deterrent for anyone threatening the Roman state. A century before the death of Jesus, in 70 BC, the slave Spartacus led a rebellion that was put down so brutally that almost 7,000 men from his army were crucified on a great avenue of crosses along the Appian Way. The Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, at least allowed Jesus' followers to take his body down from the cross and bury him. Nobody gave the order to take Spartacus's men down and their skeletons hung for years. This was a very brutal time and crucifixion a very brutal death. The garden tomb is a short walk from the old city walls near the Damascus Gate and just around the corner is the tomb itself. City wall down there. That's Mount Moriah, the north end up there. And that's the skull over there. As you can see, the door into the tomb is quite small, but the tomb itself roomy, about 14 and a half feet by 10 and 7 and a half feet high, which is quite high considering that few men stood more than 6 feet tall. The entrance would be made intentionally small to deter grave robbers. To the front, we see the weeping chamber. The mourners would be women. And on the right, here, a low wall hewn from the rock divides the room. Below, 
a pillow has been cut out of the rock and beyond an unfinished tomb, perhaps intended for Joseph of Arimathea's wife. There is a small window in the outer wall. If you look up here, you can see what appears to be a window in the tomb. We're not actually certain what it was for. It could have been for ventilation purposes. On the other, on the other hand, some Jewish tombs of that period had a thing called a nephesh, a Hebrew word that means soul hole. And the Jews believed that after the body had been in the tomb for three days, the spirit departed through that window. Now it's interesting because if you remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, he waited for four days before doing it. Do you remember? Now he waited probably for four days because had he done it earlier, people would have said the spirit was still in the body and he wasn't truly dead. So we believe that's why he waited. So it's interesting, isn't it? Now the other interesting um, feature of this window is it allows light to fall on that grave there where we believe the body of Jesus would have rested. And that would explain why John was able to bend over and look in and actually see to the tomb and see the linen cloth lying there. Because I feel if it was one of those other tombs, he'd be looking into a black hole and would not have been able to see. So again, it does fit the biblical picture. The tomb is certainly large enough for Peter and John to enter it and find two angels seated where Jesus' body had lain, one at the head and the other at the foot. Only the finished localis, the grave area, looks to have been used, and there is no sign that any other body was ever here. Covering the tomb that you can see in front of you, except that this right-hand side had collapsed, we think, due to earthquake damage, and at that time they strengthened it with these stone blocks. <clears throat> Now, when you go into the tomb, don't think it's a, a natural cave that's been adapted as a tomb. It's not. It's been cut out of the rock, just as described in the Bible. And it's a large and impressive tomb, speaking of it being the tomb of a rich man like Joseph of Arimathea. A poor person couldn't afford a tomb of this kind. Now, when it was in use as a tomb, the entrance was much lower than you see it at the moment. We think it was only about a meter high. So you'd have to bend down to look into it or to go into it. And as you probably know, it was sealed by a large rolling stone, wasn't it? Now, we've never found that original stone, but it would have looked a little like that one behind you. Can you see that one there? That one's dated back to that period, so it gives you some idea of what it, what it looked like. There's no smell or sense of decay. If this had been Joseph of Arimathea's unfinished family tomb, it would almost certainly have looked like this. Jesus rose from the dead in three days, and his body did not decay. That the tomb was prepared in a hurry. Here are the chisel marks to show where the rock was hollowed out. But something is far more interesting. Someone has extended the localis. The burial chamber has been extended to make a body several inches taller than the person it was intended for. We know that if this is the tomb used to bury Jesus, the stonemason was in a hurry because all preparations had to be completed by the Sabbath. The tomb was originally designed for someone five feet eight inches tall quite tall in ancient times. The localis has been hastily lengthened and the space is now something over six feet. It is believed that Jesus was around the same height as our cameraman, five feet, 11 inches tall. Now we come to investigate the area outside the tomb. There is a large cistern, which confirms that it was almost certainly a garden in Jesus's time. The dry climate meant saving water for irrigation in underground containers in the rock. This cistern holds a quarter of a million gallons of water, the third largest in Jerusalem, and it must have been used to irrigate a large and luxuriant garden.
If I could remind you of a verse in John's Gospel, do you remember? It says in John's Gospel that at the place where Jesus was crucified there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Now we've seen the possible site of the crucifixion at that place called Skull Hill. Here we are in a beautiful garden, but what's the evidence to say there was a garden here at the time of Jesus? If you look at this photograph, I think this shows you part of the evidence that tells us there was a garden here at that time. This is a very large water system. As you know, they dug them all over Israel in the past, didn't they, to store the rainwater in the winter so they had plenty of water for the dry season. This one, the head of it, is just over there and it goes deep underground. It's the third largest water cistern in Jerusalem and it takes about a million litres of water and it's been dated back to pre-Christian times, so it's over 2,000 years old. So it was certainly here at the time of Jesus. Now the discovery of this cistern, and also an ancient wine press that's been found here, tell us this was a garden at that time, not the sort of garden that you're looking at now, but we believe it was a cultivated area, and uh, we think it was probably a vineyard for growing grapes with lots of water in these to water those grapes. Now because it's so extensive, it also suggests that it's a garden of a rich man like Joseph of Arimathea. We know he was wealthy, don't we? The Bible tells us. And if you remember, he and Nicodemus, they'd both become secret followers of Jesus, hadn't they? But in the end, they had the courage to come out in the open and they went to Pilate, the Roman governor, asked for his body, and the Bible says they buried him in Joseph's own new tomb. So all the three things described in John's Gospel are found here on this site. So you can see how well it does fit the biblical account. Just such a garden as would belong to a wealthy merchant like Joseph of Arimathea. Yards away, we have a wine press, which must have been used for the garden's fruit. It was there before Jesus' burial and is one of the largest ever found in Israel. The cistern and the wine press are circumstantial evidence, but the most telling piece of evidence is just outside the tomb. St. Matthew tells us that after Jesus' body was prepared for burial and the disciples had sent their farewells, the tomb was closed by rolling a huge circular stone across the entrance and sealing it in place. The heavy stone and seal were fitted on the orders of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take your guard. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. the Jewish establishment and the Roman authorities were afraid of Jesus and what he represented. After all, only a few days ago, he had overturned the moneylenders' tables in the temple and told they were mocking God. He was threatening both the Jewish establishment and the Roman occupiers. When Jesus was arrested, Pilate asked him to claim that he was the king of the Jews to commit treason. Jesus didn't deny it. He turned it back on Pilate. Is that your own idea? No wonder the Romans were jittery. The chief priest and the Pharisees already knew the prophecy that the Messiah would rise again and were desperate to make sure that when Jesus was dead and buried, he would stay that way. Looking at this model, we can see how the tomb was sealed 
the entrance and outside it the great stone with its guide track for rolling it into place. Once the stone was rolled along the guide track, completely covering the entrance, it stopped. We can see the ledge that stopped it to the right. Our group measured the outside of the tube and tried to estimate how big the stone would have been. This is the shape and we estimated it would have had a diameter of 12 feet and weigh nine tons. To prevent anyone rolling the stone back, an iron spike may have been driven into the rock face. It would now be quite impossible to open the tomb. It was sealed as far as Pilate and the chief priest was concerned for all eternity. But St. Luke tells us that when Mary Magdalene and the other women went to the tomb on the third day, they found the stone rolled to one side. St. Matthew tells us there was an angel in the tomb and that the panic-stricken guards had fled. Realizing that Jesus' body was no longer in the tomb and terrified what Pilate would do if he found out, the chief priest's men bribed the guards to say nothing. you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. To the left hand of the entrance, there is evidence that a metal spike was driven into the rock at a height of 71 inches. There was probably another spike on the other side, but that since disappeared. Critics claim that this is not evidence of a metal spike at all, but remnants of shrapnel from battles of the last century. However, tests have shown the metal is ancient. Whilst later critics doubt its authenticity, there is plenty of evidence that early Christians believed this the right place. The walls inside the tomb have red crosses etched and painted into them together with the Greek symbols for Alpha and Omega, which Jesus, with the phrase, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, was used as a metaphor for himself. Very often, we find that holy sites named in the Bible have been holy for generations, and that the same places were associated with prophets that later figure in the New Testament. We decided to investigate the links between the temple and garden tomb to events in the Old Testament. The Temple Mount itself, when we look at a topographic view, forms a yod, which is the tenth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the first letter in God's name in Hebrew. When written down, it forms the shape of a hand, as is clear from the picture. In Deuteronomy, Jehovah tells the Israelites to make sacrifices where I shall place my name. In Old Testament times, this whole area was known as Mount Moriah, made famous by the story of Abraham and Isaac. In the New Testament, the key site becomes the Temple on the Mount because it was here that Jesus preached his most famous sermon, confronting the religious leaders of the day for their hypocrisy. The Temple on the Mount is 741 meters above sea level, but it is not the highest point. The top of the mountain, Golgotha, stands 777 meters high. 777, three sevens, in biblical terms, the perfect number, the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega. So was God foretelling the sacrifice of his own son, the Alpha and Omega, through the testing of Abraham 
Near the part of the site that looks like the base of the skull, the team found what many scholars believe to be Jeremiah's grotto or prison. Jeremiah is famous in the Old Testament and in medieval paintings for his lamentations on the first fall of Jerusalem, which occurred in 587 BC. The team could find no evidence of this grotto apart from this ancient map, which clearly bears the legend Jeremiah's Gate. We asked Manuel Dominguez and Alex Newton to translate this ancient map, which was in French. Does it, does it look like um, Jeremiah Grotto? Let me see. Grotto de Jeremiah. Yes, yes, that's it. It's Jeremiah's Grotto. I think it is. Are you sure? Yeah, yes, Jeremiah Grotto. Grotto de Jeremiah. Right, that's, that's right. Very interesting. That's yes. very accurate. Yes. Even in the site of Jeremiah's Grotto is directly opposite and is now a banana warehouse. The present owner was most hospitable, kindly showing us around. By now, the team had found so much evidence that their heads were reeling. Unfortunately, it was also time to go home, and from this point onwards, most of our inquiries would become library and internet-based, but no less exciting for that. One of the advantages of the internet is being able to call up documents and maps at the click of a mouse, but Simon spent many hours on the computer before he managed to find what he was looking for. The question was, what other evidence is out there to prove whether or not the tomb in the garden is the real thing? The topography of the landscape forms crucial evidence. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it was impossible to imagine what it must have looked like in Jesus' time. At the tomb in the garden, this is somewhat easier. It's a garden. The image of a garden recurs in several paintings of the scene. Some of these ancient maps place the crucifixion in the same landscape. Might it be that some of these depictions are based on knowledge which is now lost to us? The team visited the Jewish National and University Library in Israel to confirm the date of these ancient maps. Dated 1584, 300 years before the garden tomb was discovered. This map shows us a, an imaginary depiction of a biblical Jerusalem. You can see here, for example, uh, Jesus and the course he made through the city until the place of the crucifixion. They, Map, the original map was uh, printed in Köln in 1584 by Christian van Adekam, considered a very important depiction of, uh, of Jerusalem. Published uh, at the beginning of the 17th century, um, it is drawn after uh, a map uh, dated uh, 1584. Take a look at this map from the 16th century. We can see the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is being arrested, and the old gate through which he will carry his cross to Golgotha. Well, this is a fascinating map. Obviously, it's the first time I've ever seen it. The salient points that are important is way up the top is the Mount of Olives. And when the New Testament speaks of a garden, it speaks of either a citrus grove or an olive grove and that's an olive grove, and the Mount of Olives would bring right down through to Gethsemane. And we know that the Lord was in Gethsemane prior to his uh, final trial, and then he would have been led out of the city. Today's Damascus Gate is very ornate, but underneath Damascus Gate, we do find there the remains of an Herodian Gate, and uh, that area has been associated with gates. Saul of Tarsus would have left from there. The great sacrifice got to be on the side of the north according to Levitical law. And this picture down here that they've uh, drawn in of uh, at the crucifixion site does appear to be on the side of the north 
and it is outside the gate and the writer to the Hebrews makes that abundantly clear and Roman law said crucifixion had to be outside city precincts. So I find this fascinating and it could well be that uh, this is something that of great interest, frankly, that I've never seen before. If we now turn the picture like this to match up with a modern map of Jerusalem, we can see how closely the main features agree. The site of the crucifixion lines up with the place of the skull and the location of Jesus' tomb lines up precisely with the tomb in the garden. One of the maps shows the tomb of Saint Stephen who was the first disciple to be martyred. This tomb is just yards away from the garden and the team went in search of it, finding a church dedicated to Saint Stephen on the exact spot. This raises another series of questions. How did the printmaker know of these locations? Both these sites were covered in rubble and not fully excavated until the 19th century. The city boundaries have changed and the walls have been rebuilt. But if we remove this section, we find Golgotha, both on a corner and outside the city walls, exactly where it should be according to the Gospels. An earlier map drawn before Christ shows the position of the early walls with great accuracy and puts the gate of Ephraim in the same position as later editions. This map was printed circa 1734 in Augsburg. The author is Matthäus Solter. We can see one plan of Jerusalem and one view here below. It's a, a printed map and hand colored. Right. Do you know when it shows the time? Well, it relates to the ancient uh, city ancient. of Jerusalem. Before Christ? I believe so. Golgotha is shown inside the northern boundary, opposite the present garden tomb. Due to the height of the rock, no gate existed adjacent to Calvary. The nearest is what we now call the Damascus Gate, which is believed to have been built over the old gate. This print, almost certainly from the same period as the other, shows the sites in more detail and where they are today at the northern corner and just outside the Damascus Gate. Peter, our guide to the tomb in the garden, is quite clear. If a chapel did stand at this spot, it would have been very ancient and date from long before Jerusalem became part of the Muslim Empire. If this was the case, it would be evidence of very early Christian worship on this site earlier than the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Look back at the outside of the tomb, the way it's arched over the top and the ledges um, have suggested that perhaps there was an early place of Christian worship built on the outside of this tomb. In other words, like a little church, and it's suggested that that there, where those people are standing, could have been a baptismal pool for baptisms, and the water would have drained through that panel, running across, to a water cistern that's behind that first door. Now, if you look up here, there's a very interesting cross carved on the rock face. Can you see the shape of it? It's unusual. That's the top part, and the upright of the cross comes down and ends in a hook. Now, we believe that was put there during the Byzantine period, so it's pretty old, and it's meant to look like a ship's anchor. Now, early Christians chose that shape because in the letter to Hebrews, Jesus is referred to as the anchor of our souls, and that was adopted as a symbol of their faith. So there are these signs here that perhaps early on Christians were coming here. Were they venerating this place because they believed it was the tomb of Jesus? The final question must be, 
is the site of the crucifixion below the place of the skull, where our research team is standing. Or above the escarpment, as shown in the next picture. We can find nothing in the scriptures to tell us. But this painting dates back to the 14th century. It was painted in France, and Simon unearthed this copy in the British Library. Here is Jesus on the cross, but what's most interesting is behind him. Could this be evidence of the escarpment below the skull? If we consider the provenance of this picture, France in the 14th century, there's something else we should consider. The Knights Templar were very powerful at this time in France, too powerful for the king. He seized their treasure and condemned them to death. But the Knights Templar guarded the holy places in Jerusalem, just the people to know where the crucifixion took place and where Jesus was buried. General Gordon argued that it must be above the place of the skull because it's the highest point of all. As a military commander, he knew the importance of seizing and holding high ground and the symbolic reasons for crucifying Jesus where the entire city might see. As we have seen, both the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Tomb of the Garden are accepted by one set of scholars or another as the site of Jesus' tomb. The Holy Sepulchre has centuries of tradition behind it and the first Christian Roman Emperor as its patron. In contrast, we have the tomb in the garden, relatively unspoiled, tranquil, green, an oasis in the city, all the good things we expect of a garden. The garden, too, has become caught up in the battles and feuds between the different denominations. For a time, at General Gordon's instigation, the Anglican Church adopted the site, but no longer. On one level, what does it matter which or either is the true site of the tomb? Frankly, I don't mind what we think about the place because the place isn't important. What is important is the person behind the place. And the person behind this place is none other than the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And 2,000 years ago, death couldn't hold Jesus. And the glorious message of the garden is this, that 2,000 years on, likewise, death won't hold those of us who die in Christ Jesus. Is the tomb in the garden nothing more than a pleasant place to pray, as some scholars have said? We don't think so, and in this film, the team believe that they have made the case for the tomb in the garden being the site of Jesus' tomb. So, drawing from all of the resources we have used, what have we discovered about this story? We know from St. Matthew's Gospel that the crucifixion site was at a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, and we have seen this in the rock formation. Only yards from here, there is a tomb cut from the rock, which St. Matthew describes thus, After wrapping Jesus in a clean linen cloth, Joseph of Arimathea laid him in his own new tomb, which he had hewn from the rock. If this was Joseph of Arimathea's garden, he would have most likely chosen to be buried there. And we know that nearby, there is a large cistern for irrigating the garden. Way back from a tree back there, way down through here, it's deep down underneath, 
It's plastered with ancient Roman plaster, and we can store up in here a quarter of a million gallons of water. The Bible speaks of an earthquake at the moment of Jesus' death, and Simon can be seen pointing at a large split in the rock. But the Bible also says there was a violent earthquake. And interestingly enough, there is a large earthquake crack here in the rock face. Can you see that? Which could, of course, be evidence of that very earthquake. The tomb is large enough to accommodate not only Peter and John, but also the two angels Mary Magdalene saw in the tomb. In white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. We know from the graffiti inside the tomb that it was a place of worship only decades after the resurrection. Outside the tomb is evidence of a stone track and a piece of very old metal driven high up into the rock, which we think was a spike to prevent anyone breaking into the tomb and rolling the nine-ton stone away. Like all good storytellers, we are keeping the most interesting and exciting piece of evidence until last. On Easter morning, Mary and the disciples found the tomb empty with the burial sheets still there. We know this because St. Luke tells us that Peter ran into the tomb and found the strips of linen lying by themselves. Turin Cathedral is home to a relic venerated by many and questioned by some. It is a piece of cloth that carries the marks of a human body, a man whose face and torso are bloody, lacerated and tortured. The cloth also shows the marks from what could be a crown of thorns and a spear wound in the side. It is just as Jesus' body would have looked when it was placed in the tomb. This is the Turin Shroud. You will remember the tomb in the garden had been hurriedly cut out as if the body which was going to be buried was taller than the man who had given the tomb, the man who should have been buried in it. Have a look around, you can see the whole place is shaped. Cut, made, and over here is the locker, the grave area. Now we've got two graves here. This one, and uh, this has never been finished. This is how they would cut a grave. Just square, stone pillow at this end, resting place. And then they would wait until they knew how tall the person was to be rested there. And then they would finish it as we see that grave on the far side. It's got a foot portion cut out, just a little portion cut out for their feet. That tells us that grave was used. Someone lay there. And the New Testament says that uh, Joseph gave to Jesus a new tomb in which no one else ever lay. On a hunch, Simon contacted 10 scholars who over the years have worked on the Turin Shroud. There were many questions he wanted to ask, but one held the key for him. How tall was the man in the Turin Shroud? The first reply dropped into his email box in just an hour. In reply to your inquiry, the height of the man in the Turin Shroud is 5 feet 11 inches. A tall man, then, would fit into the hurriedly altered tomb. The extra inches would accommodate Jesus rather than the 5 feet 8 of Joseph of Arimathea. This was most exciting news for Simon. That night, he could not sleep as he waited for the other replies to drop in. All were of the same opinion. One reply was from Barry Schwartz, an American who had been the official photographer of the Shroud of Turin research project. In 1978, this was the first scientific attempt to prove the Shroud's authenticity. Barry confirmed the team's findings. 
First question people always ask me is, how did you get involved with the Shroud of Turin? After all, you're Jewish. And of course, I always say pretty much the same thing. That's exactly what I said when they asked me. Um, I had finished a scientific project for Los Alamos National Laboratories through a company in Santa Barbara where my studio was. At the end of that project, the gentleman called me and he said, Barry, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? And I said, but Don, I'm Jewish. <laughs> and he said, so am I, remember, because he too was one of the Jewish team members. At any rate, I didn't feel very comfortable at the beginning with this, and I continued to be a member of the team for about two months, and I was still feeling very uncomfortable about my involvement, and I came to the conclusion that perhaps I shouldn't be a member of the team, and what I said to Don Lin from the Jet Propulsion Laboratories, who was one of the real imaging experts on our team, was, gee, Don, what's a nice Jewish boy like me doing involved on such a Christian project? And he looked at me, and he said, apparently, Barry, you've forgotten that the man in question is a Jew. And of course, I said, no, I know that. And he says, so you don't think God would want one of his chosen people on our team? And I laughed, and I said, of course, I didn't think that. And then he said, look, Barry, let me give you some advice. Go to Turin. Do the best job you can. One day you'll know why, because God doesn't tell you in advance what the plan is. Well, that seemed like pretty good advice to me, and I stayed on the team, and I've now been involved directly in the examination, and the study, and the research on the Shroud of Turin for 30 years. In addition to that, of course, I founded Shroud.com 12 years ago in 1996, and that website has grown to become the largest and the oldest and probably the most relevant website on the Shroud of Turin on the entire internet. And the reason for that simply is that I have no bias from a Christian or non-Christian point of view. I can stick to the science, I can stick to the facts, and so I guess I serve a bigger role in the world of the Shroud today as someone who brings this information to a broader audience. And interestingly, the photographs I made in 1978 are probably far less important than the contribution that I've now made over the last 12 years. The Shroud of Turin is almost certainly the most tangible relic of Jesus' life and death. Obviously, the most important thing on the Shroud of Turin is the image of a man, front and back, ventral and dorsal, that appears along the full length of the cloth with the ventral and dorsal images head to head with an appropriate space between them for the cloth to have been wrapped the way it was. Of course, the most important thing that we see if we look at the ventral image, front image, is the man himself. And as he stands there, you can see his arms crossed before him. You can see his shoulders, although they were damaged in the fire of 1532 and there are holes and patches there now. You can then look down the body, see the crossed hands. You can then see the legs, the knees, the thighs, the calves, and even the feet on the ventral image. Now, when you look at the shroud a little closer, you'll also see a number of stains, the most important of which, if you look directly near his heart, is the darkest blood stain, which we call the spear wound blood stain, that appears on the shroud. And interestingly enough, although you can't see it with the naked eye, when you photograph this area with UV fluorescence photography, you see a large serum stain, invisible to normal lighting, but visible there on the shroud with UV fluorescence photography. Now, as you come down the shroud and look again at the hands, you'll see blood stains near the wrists of the man of the shroud. Now, this would be the crucifixion wound from where the hands were nailed to the cross. And unlike all medieval and Renaissance art, which always depicts the nailing of the hands through the palms themselves, this shows an exit wound further up the wrist and would have been the correct exit wound for the nailing through the wrists because the Romans did this all the time and they knew very well where to nail the hands so they wouldn't come loose and in the middle of the palm is not the place to do that, closer to the wrist. So unlike all medieval and Renaissance art, the shroud shows it forensically accurate in the wrist. Now if you come down and look at the feet, you'll also see at the feet blood stains. Now there's some argument as to whether both feet were individually nailed or whether one foot was nailed over the other. We cannot tell this from the blood stains on the shroud. So it is impossible for us to make that conclusion, draw that conclusion from the Shroud of Turin. Now when you look at the back side of the man, the dorsal side of the man, there you see something really amazing. 
there are a lot of markings across the back. Now, if you look closely, you'll find these extend all the way down past the buttocks to the back of the legs. And even on the front or ventral view, you'll find many of these because these are dumbbell-shaped markings, scourge wounds from a Roman flagrum. And a Roman flagrum had three thongs, leather usually, and at the end of each, a dumbbell-shaped lead or bone weight. And these are the marks that we see on the Shroud of Truum. We see dumbbell-shaped bruises, many of them that drew blood, actually broke the skin. And these cover the man's body, not just the back, where they're predominant, but also many came around the front. Because as the scourger moved a little closer, his whip would then wrap around the front of the body and leave markings on the front of the body as well. Now, if we look at the face of the man of the shroud, we see blood stains on the forehead. And if we go further, we see blood stains in the hair. And if you look at the dorsal or back view of the head that shows the back of the head, you see many blood stains there as well. We have stains on the shroud, on the head, as if from a cap or crown of thorns. So once again, Everything about the Shroud of Turin, all of the bloodstains, all of these markings are accurate to the gospel account of what was done to Jesus when he was scourged, beaten, and, and if you look at the man's face, once again I, I should mention, if you look at the face, look at the bruised cheekbones, one more swollen than the other, but both rather swollen. So this man had been beaten in the face, he had been scourged, he had been then crucified, and then he was speared in the side. And what we have here is an accurate depiction, forensically accurate, of a crucified man, exactly as the gospel accounts of Jesus. And it conforms exactly to the shape and length of the burial space in the tomb in the garden. Well, the question about the garden tomb is an interesting one. The uh, first thing I have to honestly admit is that I've not ever really done a true study of the garden tomb myself, only the shroud. But uh, understanding that the height of the man in the carved garden tomb is 5 foot 11 uh, is certainly coincidental with what I have always perceived as the average height of the man of the shroud, which I've always put at about 5 foot 11. Now, let me amplify that a little by saying that remember, First of all, the Shroud of Turin is not a stable substrate. In other words, it can be stretched, it can be moved. And as a matter of fact, through the centuries, the Shroud of Turin has actually been displayed, hung from balconies at one end with weights on the other end to keep it from flapping in the wind. So obviously, the, uh, the, a certain amount of stretching is inevitable with the Shroud of Turin particularly on the long dimension because that's the way it was often displayed. Now, the other thing one has to consider is this is a linen, finely woven linen cloth, and it can change its length by as much as a centimeter or more based solely on the humidity in which the shroud itself is kept. So there are many variables and there's great debate about how exactly how tall the man on the shroud is. Some people have said six feet, some people have said six feet one. Um, but again, remembering the stretching capability and of course the recent 2002 restoration where they smoothed out all the wrinkles and re-sewed the cloth onto a different backing cloth, the shroud grew by another eight centimeters. So that too would have impacted the dimensions of the man on the shroud if they were to be measured. So the best studies and the average of all of the arguments, if you will, as to how tall the man on the shroud is uh, sort of averages out to about 5 foot 11, which is what I then typically use as my answer to the question, how tall is the man on the shroud? Remember, I came to that conclusion long before I knew about the garden tomb. So is this a coincidence? Well, if the garden tomb is the authentic tomb in which Jesus was buried, and if the shroud of Turin is the authentic cloth that wrapped his body, then it would go to one could easily conclude then that it makes sense that they would both be the same height. As I said, I've never made the study of the garden tomb, although I might not uh, want to put it aside, might want to go do a little more research now myself, just because I find this is a fascinating coincidence. To the team 
This was both the proof they were seeking and the final stage of their quest. It was also the beginning of another, this time the Shroud of Turin. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age.